Hello everybody and thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's so exciting to be here and um, celebrating Barbara and this amazing book, Writing as the Practice of Freedom, Selected Writings of Loretta Nobo. Um, it's really difficult to introduce you because I could have just said, this is Barbara, my friend, who's amazing, who I fangirl all the time, but I'll do the formal stuff as well. <laughs> Um, Barbara is a professor in HOD at the English department in, um, at UCT and I have been following her work from day dot and she's just been an amazing thinker, intellectual, black feminist, provocateur and just amazing person who has made my life as a scholar so much easier because I get to kind of trail her footsteps in the work that she does. So it's really exciting to celebrate um, your work and celebrate Loretta Ngobo as well. Um, and I'm going to try kind of keep it contained to this book because it's really easy to kind of talk about all your other work because it is so wonderfully interrelated. Sorry, I made notes. So um, I want to start kind of from the beginning and I like the stories that you tell about like the stories behind the story. So we see the book, but they're always stories that influence what happens when we see the book. And um, I'm interested because you've been having a relationship with Mam Nobo for since, since. I mean, she's in your PhD. I did bring, well, this is Marion's copy, but she's also in, and I wrote my story anyway. So she's been a companion of yours for a while. So maybe you could just speak about that journey of the behind the scenes of this book and your coming to Loretta Nobo. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Atambili. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's lovely to see um, everyone and all these friendly, uh, familiar faces. And um, I want to just say thank you to Tunzi and Samantha from HSRC Press, um, who I've met for the first time tonight, Samantha, and um, for their wonderful support in this journey and for being such great um, publishers. Thank you. Um, so, and may I introduce Dr. Atambile Masola, oh, myself. Sorry. <laughs> who's also, um, who's my friend, but also a lecturer in historical studies at the University of Cape Town in the Department of Historical Studies. Um, and we've, I wouldn't say collaborated, but I commissioned a piece twice now on Loretta Nobo. Um, for different publications that I edited, and you were a co-author with Makosa Zana Kaba. So we've also, I think... Co-conspired. Yes, co-conspired <laughs> to create um, visibility for a particular writer. So thank you for your question. Um, to answer, I've been... My, my PhD, the journey really started with my PhD, which I did in Maryland, and there's a very special person here from Maryland, also Emma um, Gentle. Hi, <laughs> I was so happy to see her. Um, so, we, at the University of Maryland, where I was writing a PhD about black South African women writers, and um, what I really wanted to do is write the book that I couldn't find to read, which gave us a history or attempts to give a literary mapping of black South African women's novels in English. I have to make all these disclaimers. They were novels, they're in English, they're not in indigenous languages. And um, so uh, that was the project where I started reading um, um, Loretta Nobo's work really quite in some detail and intensity and started reading her secondary work. And there's a chapter in the book um, which, which uh, looks at 10 women writers, uh, black South African women writers, the, the second book that I published where I analyze her work and have also written about her life story. Um, I, I met um, um, Mrs. Nobo once in when I was doing my PhD research because I wanted to interview her about her life and I write about this in the book. I went to Durban, I flew flew there and did this amazing interview with her and she was so kind and generous and as I was leaving she said, oh, where are you going? And I said, well, I don't really know where I'm going. I'm going to 
go and find a hotel somewhere and I'm going to sleep there because my flight was the next day and I was only there to see her. I didn't know anyone in Durban at that time. Um, and she said, no, you will do no such thing. You will sleep in my uh, guest bedroom um, tonight. You're not going to go to a hotel, especially if you don't know where you're going to sleep. So, and, um, so I was very fortunate to be able to spend the day with her. And we had lunch, and then she, took, she went to work. She, I think she was, at that point, still a, a parliamentary, a provincial member of parliament in the KwaZulu-Natal legislature. So she's quite a fascinating figure. And the next morning, she woke me up at 5 or 4.30 and put me in a taxi to the airport and said, OK, bye. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, you know, she wasn't going to let me wander around alone in a strange city where I knew no one. Um, and uh, th that was one of the encounters I had with her, or the only in-person encounter. But of course, the writing um, that I fell in love with, I, I first read, she's written two novels, or published two novels, um, and they didn't die, was the second one, which really catapulted her into an international status as a writer. The first one was Cross of Gold, um, and I, I detail in the, this uh, biography, in the biographical section, the struggles that she had to publish it. So really, I'm meandering off the point and the question. Um, I, 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 I was really obsessed, and I still am obsessed, with black women writers who started writing during apartheid, uh, because it was such a struggle for them to be published. If you look at her and Miriam Tladi, for example, Mrs. Nobo went into exile. Um, I, I'll read a bit later how she left the country under grave danger of being arrested. And um, I wanted to show the kind of structural barriers that women like them faced um, when they dared to assert a voice and write. And so I just became more and more fascinated also with um, how they responded to oppression, to really extreme oppression, because the, the state was bent on silencing them. And if they could kill them conveniently or without any consequence, they probably would have, but they couldn't. And so they, they harassed women like um, Loretta Nobo. She was followed by the special branch. She was a school teacher at the time she went into exile. And she had to destroy all of her writing in 1963. And, and despite this, um, she still managed to articulate and produce um, a very beautiful and moving and historically important body of work. So she's published two novels and two, she edited two collections. And also, once I started reading her seriously, I found a number of essays that she authored uh, about gender, about herself as a writer, about processes of coming into voice as a writer. Yeah, I just want us to pause there for a moment because we're going to come back to that in terms of situating the book. And maybe just to say, I should have said at the beginning that this is part of a series, right? Um, so there's this collection that Barbara has put together about Loretta Ngobo. Pumla Gola edited the one on Miriam Gladi, who you also write about in your PhD. Uh, Bongani Nyoga did Achima Feche. Um, Shireen Hasim did Fatima Mia. Who am I leaving out? Wangari Matai was done by Grace Musila. So think of it as a conversation together with those voices as well. So it's very... Um, I mean, just to add to what Barbara's saying, the, the Voices of Liberation is not a mistake. It's part of a, a longer conversation about these writers. And it's also quite fascinating that Miriam Gladi and Loretta Nobo now kind of come together again and even the relationship that they had while they were both alive. Um, but you've started speaking to it already in terms of her life and how she went into exile and just some of those challenges and the and the vicissitudes of just becoming a black woman writer in apartheid and what it meant. And I think I want us to spend a bit of time on that um, and maybe just speak about how that changes over time. So you've spoken about her, I mean, her two novels that she only publishes actually while she's in exile. But her journey with writing starts much earlier. Her journey with storytelling starts much earlier. But it kind of evolves over time until even while she's an MP. Maybe just give us a few snapshots of what that journey looked like. 
Right, so um, she was so, she's so interesting in that she was very much aware of traditions of storytelling. Um, she recalls and writes um, in interviews and in her own writing about the influence of her family and especially the matriarch, so her mother and her maternal grandmother, and they were storytellers. Um, and they rendered a kind of world, even as she was born, when she was growing up as an infant. Um, she had her own specific poetry that was dedicated to her. Um, and the whole, her whole world was imbued with storytelling, folktale, um, and the oral tradition. And so she was really steeped in it. She, grew, she was born near Itlopo in um, the KwaZulu-Natal province in um, 1931 and she became very much, she came into consciousness in this um, environment of storytelling and um, talks about her mother and father were both school teachers and how they encouraged reading and a love of reading and there were books in the house and how she then, education was very important, even though her father died when she was quite young, I think she was eight. And she was writing at that time even little bits, um, she calls them small figments and fragments um, in an essay. And, but she says, she recalls that she would always destroy them because she didn't um, think they were worth anything. And so she grew up with a, an interesting paradox shaping her life. Her parents believed very much, and her grandparents, in the value of education. And she was, in fact, educated at Inanda Seminary um, until matric and went on to Fort Hare. And she writes about being one of 35, I think, women at the whole Fort Hare University in the year when she entered. So her, in, in her culture, her family culture, um, and in the schools that she went, there was a, at the university especially, there was a kind of a ideology that women's words and opinions and ideas were not valued. So the paradox is that she was being educated all the time and educating herself and politically educated also at Fort Hay, but the world and especially her professors around her told her that she was not supposed to be there, not worthy of being there. And so I think um, she writes about having internalized that and having to actually consciously work on that in order to become a writer, that conditioning, that women's voices don't matter. And so she became a school teacher and still um, was writing, but said that she often destroyed her writing. And in 1963, she was being watched. Her husband was A.B. Ngobo, who was a founder member of the Pan-Africanist Congress. And so he was in jail. He was um, awaiting trial. He was a treason trialist. And she was being followed, and messages that she was writing to other people were being intercepted. And she was about to be arrested. So, so there was also an impulse in her to destroy any evidence of writing or anything she may have written down at that time in the early 1960s. So it is only when she goes into exile, and she has a, quite a difficult time in exile. Um, she goes to Swaziland, and then... Um, to Lusaka, and then to England. And at the end, it's only when she has a job in England where she can fully turn her attention, where she says, I have the psychological time and space to be able to start thinking of myself seriously as a writer. And then I think her writing really took off in that particular time. Mm. I wanted to read at the beginning, you just reminded me, just a small quote um, in one of the interviews that she does, speaking to this awareness of what it meant being a black woman writer during that time, but also about the importance of putting herself into posterity in a sense, like for her writing was writing herself into history as well. And it's kind of em it's em emblematic of this book and this moment. Um, and it's a short little quote. She says, my only wish and hope is that even after I am gone, posterity will recognize some of my ideas some of my views and find my contribution to South African literature worthwhile. And it 
strikes me as someone who was so aware of the importance of what she was doing with her peers like Miriam Gladdy. And so speak a bit about those very practical challenges. I and mean, you go into a lot of detail about what it meant just publishing Cross of Gold. Like I was out of breath just reading that. Um, and as people who are now also in publishing, we kind of take for granted when things are quite easy. And then when you read this experience, you're like, oh my goodness, I know nothing. So speak a bit about that. Yeah, so I was so fortunate. I was writing the book and I, it, I think it was, well, it wasn't, I'm gonna lie if I say it was almost done, but in a way it was almost done. <laughs> I was writing the first part. And then I, um, and Tunzi will, um, testify to this moment where I, w I became um, friendly with um, Mrs. Noble's daughter, um, Ketiwe, in Johannesburg, who met uh, because I'd edited a special collection on her for a journal. And then one day, I, you know, Ketiwe and I used to chat now and then on the phone or WhatsApp, and then one day she was like, by the way, oh yeah, by the way, and there's this box full of my mother's papers. And I was like, what? <laughs> you have a box of your mother's papers and you... Um, and so I um, um, then wrote to Ntunzi, the commissioning editor, and said, Ntunzi, I just discovered there's a box of papers and I can't, you know, um, submit by the deadline because I need to. <laughs> Just whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, here you go again. Um, but but so um, I was so fortunate to f to be given access um, uh, by Kitty Way to this box, and there were amazing records, um, royalty statements, letters she received from Robert Sabukwe, who was in internal exile in Kimberley. Um, and they really moved me to tears because he had such great plans. He wanted to go to the University of Wisconsin. He'd got an office from Wisconsin, Berkeley, to do his PhD. And of course, we know what happened. He passed away. He died very young and was was not allowed to leave the country. Um, and he, in fact, wrote to her, "You, if I ever, I'm gathering my papers for my biography, and if anyone." should write it, it will be you, you know. Um, and, and, and anyway, so those are some of the things. And there were letters to publishers. And um, my voice is starting to crack a little as I'm remembering reading the letters. But the way in which she fought to have Cross of Gold published, um, she had someone, Margaret um, Robertson, I'm looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Legion, yes, 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 thank you. Um, she um, had Margaret Legion, who was who was working with her. She was uh, also a writer, and she would um, take, she would edit the work, and so she also knew publishers, and she submitted it with the help of Margaret to um, different publishers, and and so the the rejection letters were there, and I write about. Um, what the publishers said, the work is too, there are too many voices, there's no focal character, and, and um, you know, there were many rejections, and then finally she honed it and worked and worked more on it, and it was then published um, by Heinemann. And um, this was obviously a wonderful moment for her, because that was her first novel, and her, I think her first published book-length work. Um, and then, you know, it was also very sad that the book um, went out of print and I found all the letters that she wrote because I think I, I um, and I write about this in the, in the narrative, she would write out her letters longhand and then would type them up. So the record of the longhand letter is in the box and the, and the other typed letter um, there were often copies of the typed letters also, but there were duplicates of these letters. And so after about six or seven years, um, the Cross of Gold was going out of print. And um, Mrs. Nobo traveled a lot, the Cross of Gold, and she was also an activist. I mean, she was a, an activist in the PAC, but as a school teacher. So at the time, she was working as a school teacher. 
Um, she was also the president of ACTAL, the Association for Caribbean um, uh, Educators, Teaching, teaching of, of Teachers. Of yeah, I forget what ACTAL stands for. Um, I could look it up. But she was also um, the president of this body, which was like a pan-African um, body for school teachers who were immigrants. The in Association the for the Teaching of African, Caribbean, Asian, and Associated Literatures. Yes, that Marvel. was ACTAL, thank you. <laughs> so she was the president of that organization while she's writing novels, and a mother, um, and a wife, you know. And so... Um, in that capacity, she got invited to lots of conferences around the globe. Um, but when Cross of Gold was published, she was even more in demand as a speaker. And she went to lots of literary fairs. She had residencies um, in, in um, Italy. She went to the USA. Um, she was invited um, uh, to Sweden. She, was in, she went to the Writers' Conference in Zimbabwe. And people at polytechnics in the, in the UK were, used, were prescribing Cross of Gold. But the publisher made a decision that they were not reprinting it, that when the print run was going to run out, they, that would be the end. And so she writes all these letters saying, I understand it's not you know, a, a global bestseller, but the work is in demand. Wherever I go, people are saying, where can we find copies of Cross of Gold? And, we, and they can't find it, but yet there's a paradox, you're not reprinting it. And so she was extremely frustrated uh, uh, by that, by the novel going out of print. And she wrote to so many different publishers in South Africa, David Phillip, by the end of the 80s, um, towards the 90s. Um, she was, and, and, and a Zimbabwean publishers and a publisher, I think, in Ghana asking, please, will you take on this project? And they were saying, well, Heinemann owns the rights, so we're not going to touch it. And then it goes out of print. And um, when her second novel, And They Didn't Die, is published in 1990, she, see, I can go into a lot of depth when you ask these questions of the challenges. <laughs> Eventually. So, you know, she tried to have a, a, like, so then people really wanted that novel. I think a number of publishers, because it was published um, in the United States by the Feminist Press. It was published in South Africa by um, UKZ in Press, Natal Press then. Um, and it, it was published in the, in the U. K by, um, it, it, I think, I'm not sure what, what is the publisher. Um, but so it had a number of very keen publishers and she tried to make deals with the publishers. Please won't you also republish my first novel? Um, and she wrote um, to even publishers, the translation board in South Africa post-1994 and said, please, can we have Cross of Gold translated into Isizulu? Um, and, you know, Cross of Gold is still out of print. And I think she fought so hard for this, this um, book to be put back into print. And um, it, it really struck me. I had a weekend with um, Ketiwe in Johannesburg where I, because Ketiwe was like, yeah, you can look at the box of papers, but you're not taking it. You, you know, you will come to my house and read it in my living room and go home afterwards. So <laughs> that's it. Um, which, which I completely understand. I would never have let it out of my sight either um, in her shoes. And so I was there for the whole weekend, a Friday night, a Saturday, all day and a fun day. And, um, you know, we, we read every single document together. Um, and uh, it, it just struck me again um, so forcefully the barriers to publishing and especially for a black woman. And, you know, it's hard now. I mean, I don't, you say it's, it's easier. I don't, I didn't find it easy myself to be published. But when I, when I look at the obstacles that she faced, they were incredible obstacles. No one wanted to hear her story. Publishers in the UK said her story was disjointed and fragmented and had too many voices, was too, uh, there was too much in the story. And I think that is a, f a function of, of just African oral story 
storytelling traditions mm -hmm. being rendered on the page. Mm. I'll stop. Okay. But to, to, to just pick up on some of what you're saying, I think one of the, I, I wanted you to contrast, it's not so much it's easier, but because there's such a proliferation or there's been, I mean, I think this is the kind of biggest moment of publishing of black women we've seen um, ever, hi historically in South Africa. And so to contrast that experience where we take for granted that you can walk into an exclusive books and see um, shelves of, of black women I mean, just yesterday in the 1980s, someone like Loretta Ngobo was facing different kinds of challenges. So I wanted to contrast with that, but also um, the idea of erasure, which I'm going to come back to, but how here we see erasure is not um, a random thing. It's not passive. It is something that is active. It is people actively saying, no, we will not publish this. It is people actively saying it's too much. It is people actively putting those barriers in and for me, someone like Loretta Ngobo actively, forcefully, consistently writing letters to make sure that doesn't happen is like the perfect example of how then we challenge that erasure, that challenging erasure isn't just you showing up. Challenging erasure is you sitting down and advocating for yourself. And yeah, I mean, maybe speak about your, your thinking now around erasure and black women's writing, given what you've been able to find in this box and given what we're, how we're thinking about it right now in these two very different moments? Oh, that's such a big and deep question. Um, I mean, obviously, I think at that time, in 1981, Cross of Gold was published. Um, she was a foreigner. She was an exile in a foreign country. She was experiencing racism. She was experiencing sexism. Um, and, you know, I think the, the way in which she persevered was quite remarkable. I think, like other writers of that time, she published despite there were no enabling factors. There was Margaret um, Legum, who was perhaps, you know, one, one person who was supportive. Um, and, and uh, yeah, it's 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 really difficult to 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 think about it across her lifetime and into the contemporary moment because, as you say, it's so different now. Um, we have um, figures like Pumla Gola, we have Zoe Wickham, um, we have other very prolific writers, um, Sandiwe Magona, for example. I'm thinking of women writers of black women writers of, of that generation, not that Pumla's one, but, but you know, um, and, and, and we were just reflecting on this the other day when I was re recalling um, a friend of mine, um, Malika Ndlovu, uh, you know, in the 1990s in Cape Town, she co-founded an organization called Weave, Women's Expression and Artistic Voice Expression. And Diana Ferris, who is here, hello Diana, um, who's also a legendary writer, was, was part of that. And it was an activist group because in 1990s, early 2000s, there were these black women poets and writers, creative writers, Pat Farrenfort was in the group, Dila Khan, um, Mavis Smallberg, Gertrude Fester, and they were writing proposals to publishers and were not getting, and McGantry, <laughs> sorry, McGantry. <laughs> um, McGantry Pillay was also a filmmaker. And, and these, you know, if you Google these people, they are just phenomenal artists who have produced the most amazing body of work, bodies of work collectively and individually. They've really like made a path um, for other people to follow. And in the 90s, early 2000s, they could not find publishers to publish their work either. And so they self-published. They raised funds and got grants and said, well, be because people don't want to publish us, we will publish ourselves, we'll not be gatekept. Um, if I may, Diana Ferris, also talk about Diana as an example. And uh, um, um, uh, for people who don't know in the room, Diana wrote... She doesn't like being known only for this poem, but she's writ she wrote a poem about Sarah Bartman, which was actually very instrumental in having the remains of Sarah Bartman returned to South Africa from the Museo del Homme 
where she was dissected and put on display and her various body parts, including her genitals and her brain, were kept on jars, in jars on a shelf. Um, Diana's poem was seen by a senator in the French parliament, or whatever the equivalent of the parliament is, and a law was written or a bill was passed, which is one of the few bills that actually has a poem in it, which is Diana's poem. And it, 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 it's helped the negotiation um, and, and assisted in returning the remains of Sarah Bartman. And this is the significance of Diana and the, uh, her other work, the, her, the rest of her body of work about slavery, masculinity, men, women, gender relations, sex, sexuality. It's just fundamentally powerful, powerful work. And uh, a, a figure like, a, a writer like Diana, I'm, I'm speaking like I write a figure like Diana, a, a person, a writer. <laughs> Who's sitting in the room with, with us with today. Her, <laughs> with her talent and who has made, whose, whose work has made such an impact globally in the world in healing some of the wounds of apartheid and colonialism. She self-publishes her own poetry and short story collections because, you know, she's had these blocks. And so... Um, so, so you know, there's there's visibility because women, not because systems or structures have enabled us, but because women have refused, black women have refused to take no for an answer and refused to be silenced. And um, the barriers then are much more to overcome, I think, um, because... The, the narrative that I remember in the 90s and the 2000s from publishers was, well, we're post-apartheid, we're not really interested in apartheid stories anymore, can you write something different and new, and so on. Um, and and so, so this is, has always informed my work, being influenced um, by being, uh, you know, having met you, um, Magantri, Diana, um, at that time, um, and and being influenced by you, and having your work being so foundational, mm -hmm. and um, so so you know the uh, Loretta Nobo was a writer who was very very acutely aware of that um, invisibilization, mm -hmm. and so she also enabled other women to write. And her her other two books were not works of fiction, but the one was an edited collection, Let It Be Told stories by black women writers in Britain. And it is a phenomenal collection of essays by women like Agnes Sam, um, women who were Caribbean writers, Asian writers, and um, African writers who were in Britain at the time and who were exiled or migrants. And the collection where they write what it's like, personal essays about what it's like to be a black woman writing in Britain in the 1980s. It came out in 1987, and what it took for them to be published. It's an extremely moving collection of essays also, where they um, think about and write about their lives, the barriers to writing, um, their experiences of racism in Britain, and having their work out in the world. Yeah. Mm. And to that point, and then the second one was Prodigal Daughters, which is, do you want to speak to that a bit as well? The, so the, the four books, and there was also a children's book. Yes, <laughs> I'm going to come to this question of range, so don't go into Yeah, <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm pre, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going ahead. Um, so the, the, the last book that Mrs. Noble published in 2012, so at this point she's probably around 80 years old, and she'd retired... No, I don't think she was 80. Well, I can't do the math. 1931 to 1980? 70s, yeah, late 70s, early 80s. Almost 79. Okay, I don't know. Keep going. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so she, she um, retired. She spent um, close to 10 years as a, a, a pro parliamentary an MPL. Um, a member of the of the KwaZulu Natal legislature, for the IFP party, she represented the IFP party, and um, her husband had passed at that stage. They were in exile for thirty one years, 
and came back um, to uh, KwaZulu Natal. And then she took up this position in politics because I think she felt that to make an impact, that was the most impactful place to be. And that obviously impinged on her writing career, as you can imagine. Um, but when she retired, she then edited a collection of essays, again, called Prodigal Daughters, um, Experiences of South African Women in Exile. And so she, edit, she um, solicited from women um, different autobiographical essays about the experiences of exile and including her own. So she wrote the introduction, which is brilliant because it gives you a very clear um, contextualization of why black women and why people went into exile in the first place. Um, and how, um, and, and, and she really takes apart the gendered nature of exile for black women, because being a woman and an exile is, was a different experience, and being black, so there was racism, sexism, sexism within the parties, the political structures that people often were part of, the movements they were part of, not parties at that stage. Um, and and um, there are people um, whose essays in the, that work uh, includes um, Anna Marie Wolpe, for example, um, Gonda Bam. Perez, yeah, Brigalia Bam, um, uh, Baleka Khotsitsile. Mm, um, yeah, so, so it's quite an influential um, uh, collection, volume. Um, I'm teaching it at the moment uh, on a, a module that I do on gender and exile, and it's incredible. It's an incredibly rich resource. It's a historical record that you really can't find anywhere else. Um, so, you know, I think she was quite a remarkable writer in that she wrote her own stories and and wanted to obviously give voice and expression to her own creative voice but then also lifted other people as she was climbing, to use a cliche. Um, she really made spaces for other women where they could publish their work in Let It Be Told and Prodigal Daughters. Mm. So you've preempted the question, so I'm giving this sense of range. So she edits collections, she writes her own essays, some of which are in this collection for the first time. She, there was children's books. She also talks a lot about short stories that she was um, writing and then the two novels. And I'm struck by that kind of range and how it's possible for, for women who are so talented to still kind of face the challenges that she faces. Because we think, you know, if you're a brilliant writer, you'll get snatched up. You know, if you're prolific, if you're doing the work, you'll... And so what? how do we make sense of that contradiction? I mean, you've spoken about the politics of it already, but maybe if, if there are other kind of elements to that bizarreness of this person who's incredibly talented and who knows that they're incredibly talented and who knows that there's something significant about what they're doing mm -hmm. and still doesn't have... I mean, the politics, yes, but what else is happening? I don't know if that makes sense. Um, that's such a vexed question. And, and you know, the writers like Pumla writes about this kind of erasure as a, as a very deliberate thing. Um, I, 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 I don't know because she, she published a lot. So the, there are four books, but there are so many other essays um, that are also published all over in journals, in literary journals. And if you, if you have a look at the book, I've tried to include, um, there's some of the essays I included here, and I'm very grateful again to the Ngobo family for giving us permissions to use these. Um, but, um, so, so she, you know, not only was she an editor of other women's work and a creative writer who wrote beautiful fiction, but she's, she also was a literary historian, and I think, and a literary critic, whose work, that work is totally overlooked. Um, she did book reviews, for example, of Farida Karodia's work, another writer who is foundational in South African literature, who, who um, also went into exile because she was so harassed. Um, 
And, and if you read, she writes, Mrs. Ngobo writes in um, the introduction to Mariam Tladi's short story collection, um, Soweto Story. She writes this brilliant literary history of black South African writing, which, which really no one else has created. She creates this timeline of this is where black writing in South Africa started, and this is where women enter. And she, she hails Miriam Tladi in her typical generous way. Um, she hails her as, as this iconic and very important writer who um, has who pioneered, you know, and whose work is so important as a feminist and her critique of racism and sexism and the intersections of those two and class. And so um, she gave so much, um, she gave so much context and, and she gave us so much to read. If you, if you do a search of her work, the literary histories that she maps in South Africa are quite amazing. And, and I think she was a phenomenal scholar as well but that just goes completely under the radar. And I mean, it's interesting, I posted on a listserv yesterday in, at UCT, the humanities faculty, the book launch, and um, so some people wrote back to congratulate me, and then they say, I've, and if, like invariably, I've never heard of Loretta Nobo, but I'm looking forward to reading the book. So, um, it, you know, if one looks, I, I hate to compare with the United States, but but they have the place for the Zora Neale Hurstons and their, um, you know, Alice Walker that, yeah. and and um, Nella Larson, for example, the Harlem Renaissance writers. Um, we don't know our writers here, mm -hmm. and this is partly why I think these books are so important. This whole series, mm. and what's striking as was well her awareness of that. Um, one of my favorite quotes of hers, and I start my PhD with it because it was just such a powerful line, and it's in the interview with um, Margaret Damon. She says, most people have a problem with the idea that black women write. Even in England, this view of black women writers still exists. It was only when Alice Walker and a few other black American women began to publish that things began to change. And she goes on about how South Africa is so unprepared. Um, so that captures just her awareness then. And I think, I guess, our awareness now, even as... You, people like you and Pumla and Grace and everyone um, is doing this work. And maybe just as a kind of, I have one or two last questions, just as a reflection point, and I know you've kind of, we've been dancing between the past and the present a lot, um, that there was also the sense of angst about time. She was so angsty about time, um, never having enough time to write, and just time, historical time, political time. Um, and so I guess there are two parts to that. Maybe if you could say more about that angst, but also what does a writing life look like for a black woman? It's hard. I know. It's a terror. I know. <laughs> and you can go with it where you will, but just how that is epitomized in the life of her, uh, of Mangobo then, but also some of what you've spoken to, and maybe you don't need to repeat yourself, but I'm just so struck by, yeah, maybe there are too many questions in there. Yeah. It's a lot. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they can choose. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, she had, she does these interviews on the cusp of her return to South Africa after exile. And there's this palpable excitement. And she writes this beautiful essay called Now That We Are Free, which just reduces me to tears when I read it every time because it's so prescient. And... Um, you know, I'm 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 saddened by the state that our country's in, and and she almost predicts it in a way. Um, but she says in one interview with Brian Worsford, I'm so excited to go back home, but I'm also dreading it because here in England, you know, we have this life that's in a little bubble, and we let people in in South Africa. She says it's a different life. People come into your house and they stay and they don't go home and they visit and 
you know, and, and she's anticipating a lot of this. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, people will take up space and time, and I want to give and I want to um, have that. It's beautiful, but it's the antithesis of what a writer needs, which is that quiet space to think. Because writing is not just sitting and writing. Like, you, you know, one of my mentors, Deborah McDowell in the USA, used to say, to me, you also have to have time to sit on the porch. <laughs> and like, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm uh, you know, and, and I think about that a lot, because you, you have to have time to sit and think if you're a writer, like things have to percolate, like just, yeah, percolate in your brain for, you know, it, it, it's not quick, it's not like this. You have to make sense of things and have an idea and think about it. Me, I sit on the porch a lot. So, <laughs> so <laughs> um, I just, you know, and, and but, but, but we are conditioned as women and as black women to give and to give selflessly and give of our time and care and care for um, children. Um, spouses, partners, uh, you know, there, there, there is a lot of care work that goes into that. And somehow this woman m did all of that because even what she was doing for me to let me sleep there for one night was have a, a stranger in your space, which for a whole day and a night, me, I would be like, oh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I can't, like, I need my space. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I have to, pl like, I have to prepare myself for visitors and things like that. So, <laughs> uh, but she, she, you know, she did this, this practice of Ubuntu and generosity and feeding me and everything. And um, so, so, I don't know, I think to be, a, to, 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 to go on to your question with being a black, I can only speak for myself, I don't, speak for anyone, you know, I, I'm just very grateful I had a child when I was 23, because now he's <laughs> out of my house, and I can, <laughs> um, you, um, you know, and Alice Walker writes, you, the, the, the woman writer should only have one child, um, and, you know, I've never really understood that, is I've read it many, many times, but, but I'm kind of glad I only had one child. Um, so, and because I think it takes a lot of time, and you you know you've got to be intentional about carving out space. I think it's a very exciting time also to be a black woman writer in South Africa because finally uh, there is an emergence of this really rich um, body of work, and it's it's exciting. It's culturally quite exciting to feel like you know there's um, uh, C A at the back C A. David's um, is here, and Magantri, and um, you, a, you're a poet and a critic, and and we've all got our own, and Diana, and we've we've all got our own worlds that we are in through writing, and but we're also part of a community, and and we see each other and we know each other, and it's just really beautiful. We we all are in conversation in very subtle ways with each other's work, I think. I, I feel that, at least. So um, it, there's a lovely, beautiful network and very supportive network um, of, of women writers, black women writers, that I think we're moving in very interesting and different ways, collectively and individually. Mm. See, you didn't manage to answer my much of a muchness question. Um, do you want to read something as we go into Q&A? And then we will hand over. I mean, we won't even unpack it or analyze it. Do you want to do it now or later? Yeah, I, I wanted to say um, to Zabantu. Hello. Hi. I haven't met you before, but we've been WhatsApping. And I wanted to just say um, hello and introduce Zabantu Ngobo, who is um, the daughter of Loretta, and just to say thank you. It, I'm so honored. I, w I was WhatsApping you before we started, and um, it is such a beautiful joy to have you here. And just.
And, and I want to just say thank you to you um, for, for allowing me to do the work and No, it's not on. Uh, it's it, it's not quite working. Oh, okay. Um, it's not well. It's working now. Um, we just got in to Cape Town now, uh, just a little while ago, and. Um, it's so poignant to hear people talking about your mom in this way because you knew your mom as your mom. Uh, often you wondered if she was really clever. <laughs> often you questioned a lot of what she told you. And um, I'm so grateful to you for even thinking of writing about mom and also grateful to you of including mom in your uh, anthology. And um, I know that she would have been, you know, so honored and so humbled. Um, but obviously to me, she was just mum. And um, even just now in your presentation, it was just quite amazing to hear you talk about her in a different way from the way I knew her. Of course, I was there when she wrote Cross of Gold and what she said to us. I was more there, I knew her emotional state more in all these books, more than what she wrote. Um, I remember when she wrote Star Cross of Gold, she used to write it in the holidays because she was a teacher and a mom and a wife. And um, but during exile itself, I remember when we were moving from Swaziland to Zambia and all those things, and the tensions, and the, um, the, the difficulties. We were disciplined children. She would say, I would say, I'm taking the children out. I was four years old. Because you are... Please translate. You're busy. You're, 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 it's not like, yeah, it's not just busy. You've got a lot going on. Yes. And I would take the children out. And I, I could take them out. I mean, I was small myself. But I could take them out for a good two or three hours. So by the time she came to write, she could say to us, I'm writing. And we would uh, leave her. And uh, then, of course, when she was asked to do the talks uh, all over the world, she was doing them in the holidays. And um, I do remember one holiday when she didn't do them. Because I remember we all read <laughs> Roald Dahl's short stories. <laughs> and uh, we would uh, pass the book around and comment on the one that we liked. Because they were, they were weird. They were, they were actually just weird. <laughs> and I remember that summer. But mostly she was always preparing to go here and there. She was busy. And then, um, I think I mentioned it to you, something I thought perhaps worth mentioning. You know, she had hobbies. On top of all that, she had hobbies. So, one year she went to London University and just told them that, asked them if she could teach African women writers. Mm. 
She did that for some years. So she would finish teaching, then go and do this evening class, then come home late for years. Then she, would, uh, she was interested in lepidry for about 12 or 13 years. That is uh, stones, precious stones, the polishing of and all of that stuff. And also um, at a certain point, when her eyes could still see, it was uh, the silver. Um, you know, so she would make us rings out of the, the stones that she's polished. And then she would try and make you interested in a little bit of geology. And um, she would try and take you to the Geological Museum, which we, you know, we would find ourselves always saying to her, oh... Mom, when are we going to get some tea and some cake? Because, um, and there she was. This is the what, what era. And this stone is found in this era. And this is a cold day, this and this. And we just, you know, <laughs> we just, yeah. So she had a lot of hobbies as well. So what I'd like to say about her, if I think of her, is just somebody who lived an incredibly full life. Mm. And somebody who, I don't know how she did it, who knew how to carve out a space for her. Mm. Because you mentioned that. Mm. And I think, you know, as authors, all of you, um, you carve out a space for yourself. And you fight for that space. Even within the family, you know, I suppose that is why people talk about one child and so on, because of this space. Um, but she learned how to do that, and we all appreciated it. And it didn't diminish our life, funnily enough, because we had this incredibly rich person uh, with us on a daily basis. So I just wanted to thank you um, for seeing something in mum. Thank you for seeing something in mum. And uh, I know she'd be humbled. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank, you so Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to see you and to have you here. Um, are you going to read or a bit later? And then we're going to Q&A. Thank you so much, um, Sister Bandu. And that perhaps to say, the part of the reason I was able to write the children's book is because of Barbara's work and Barbara linking me to Ketiwe, who was equally generous. So also the ways in which we're able to do our work is because somebody else is doing it and opening the doors for other people too. So thank you. It's a pleasure. And you should all buy Atambile as books. Uh, she's got these three beautiful children's books um, and with portraits and character sketches and um, Mrs. Loretta Nobo is one of those in one of the, the books, yeah. Great, okay. Um, so I, I'm going to You want to use mine? Um, I'll, I'll read a section on when um, Mrs. Ngobo um, uh, decides to go into exile. And I, I, I quote quite a bit from an interview that I did with her. Um, with the whole country aflame, her husband in prison, and many of her friends and comrades jailed or going into exile, Ngobo started coming under increasing surveillance by police during the early 1960s. Late on the night of 21 May 1963, she received a chilling visit from a cousin-in-law, Oliver Munyaradzi, and her friend, Doris Pamla, informing her that her arrest was imminent. Police had found messages written in her hand from AB to an, an acquaintance outside of prison. After visiting the school where she taught, the South African police's special branch, which had been given wide powers after the Sharpeville uprising to track down, detain, and torture anti-apartheid activists, were able to match her handwriting with the note found in the young man's position, making a case for linking her writing to, quote, 
seditious material. I continue now in Mrs. Ngobo's voice. They had been trying so hard to catch me, but there wa just wasn't anything I was connected with that was underground. And then apparently they had gone to a certain young man's place. He was my husband's friend, and I had been to Pretoria to see my husband in jail. I came back. I had a little message, an innocuous little message for him. And I wrote to this young man and said, A.B. said this, because of my handwriting and all the handwriting they picked up in the school, they had visited the school, they were interviewing all the children in the school and asking them questions, asking about me and how I taught and what I taught and what not. They linked this handwriting back to me. And in that way, now they knew that I was the person they were looking for. They knew I was Abby's wife and I was passing messages on to other people. And they were coming for me. Back to my writer's voice. <laughs> Terrified that she would be imprisoned just as her husband was completing his three-year prison sentence, Ngobo had to make an instant decision to go into exile. She spent her last day in Durban clearing out her classroom and burning all her papers, mindful not to leave behind information that could lead to the arrest of her political contacts. As she worked, the heartbreaking knowledge settled into her that she would not be able to say goodbye to her mother, her aunt, her children, her husband, or her brother Putuma, who, with whom she lived at the time. The only person she told about her decision was Doris, whose help she would need to complete her hasty exit from the country. On the way home from school that day, Ngobo and Doris stopped at the bank, withdrawing money sent from abroad to help A.B. continue his law studies while in prison and brought a train ticket to Golela in Swaziland. She then went home to pack, painfully hiding her plans from the other families who lived communally on the property and her brother, whom she could not look in the eye. Again, her voice, and I'll finish with that. I was packing, choosing what was absolutely necessary for me to take with me on that most definitive journey of my life, away from home and all that I had known while trying to appear that all was well with me. I talked and laughed loudly with all I met at the water tap and hurriedly went in and out through my kitchen door and back again through the front door. I had to pretend I was cooking supper as always. To be honest, I could not control my own voice. Um, and just to, when, you know, when I was reading this again and again, to, to leave, to have to leave behind um, three children and two children probably under the ages of six or even younger than that, uh, four, yeah. 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 So so imagine having to leave with one night, you know, within one night, within one day, having to make that decision. You can't say goodbye to your mother, your brother, your children, and you just have to go because your your life is at stake. I can't imagine the anguish um, that she must have wrestled with as she packed and pretended that all was well and living with her brother Putuma ha couldn't tell him and had to pretend like she was fine. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's incredibly um, sad still to, to read that and to think about what people went through in these decisions. And she was reunited with her daughters and later and son. But also, for, for some exiles, they never saw their families again. Um, it's incredibly, unimaginably, unimaginably painful to, to think about that. I think after reading that section, I kind of put the book down and had a bit of a moment because it is quite a painful thing to think about. Um, but thanks for, for reading that. And let's open it up to the audience. Should we do one at a time? Okay. Any comments, questions? Thoughts? Yes, Marion. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Barbara and Atta. Um, 
for this incredible discussion. I have two um, kids who've gone through school in South Africa, and um, it was very painful when their set work book was Toni Morrison. Um, I know where the cage bird sings, and I remember reading it with my youngest and discussing their um, the portrayal of racism, and I, I just. I just don't know what to say about the fact that the, these books are still not published. So my question is, this is fantastic, it's a really wonderful contribution, but what's happening with Heinemann and what's happening with Miriam Tali's books? I, it's deeply painful that my children have not been able to read these extraordinary books. Yes, this is something when you get me started, um, also I can't stop. Um, the, I, you know, and they didn't die. The second novel by Loretta Ngobo is also now out of print. UKZN Press was the South African printer. We taught it at UCT for a number of years in our department. But it has now, um, I think in the last year, gone out of print. Um, and it is astounding to me. I mean, there's the NYU, the, the feminist press, which is an NYU um, University of New York imprint that is still there. Um, Zoe Wickham's books are out of print in South Africa. It's astonishing. Um, I, I, you know, w uh, with Mariam Tladi's work also, it's out of print. Her Noni Jabavu's uh, no work. It's so it's again, and it's another facet to the erasure. Um, uh, this is partly just. Yeah, I don't know if I want to say this, ne ne never mind. But um, I think, you know, w we should lobby as parents. Um, and I don't, I don't know how one goes about it because there's so many different, the provincial governments where, where, we, where people should read. You know, we should lobby that they be taught. I think Amandla, for example, by Miriam Tladi, which is a, a, a novel of, that portrays the 1976 uprising, it, it would have been so... Um, important for fees must fall, for example, for, for people to be able to access that widely. I bought a copy in the United States on eBay um, maybe 15 years ago. Um, it was $60, which was a lot of money at the time for me. And I don't know of any other copy that exists. And I'm actually thinking I need to donate the copy maybe to the library that's being reconstructed now. And, but at the same time, I'm got, I've got that selfish thing of I don't want to, you know, let go of the copy, but I know I have to. So, um, and, and, and I, I don't know, um, the, a lot of publishers have contacted me. They want to republish it. There's an estate for Mariam Plady that is still being wound up, and I don't know where that process is. It's quite mysterious to me why the work is still out of print. Um, I'm, I'm not a publisher, so I don't know the economics of publishing, and I know it's an extremely difficult, challenging um, kind of industry to be in, in South Africa. So I, I know it's very, very difficult. So, um, but, but it strikes me that one way is to get this as set works in schools would be really an incredible way of, of doing it, um, to... to the, to boost profits, to make it viable financially for publishers to do it. Um, yeah, I, I think with with Loretta Nobo's work again, and they didn't die just going out of print recently. I think there probably is an opportunity for a publisher who is savvy or and who sees the importance of this work um, to to take it up. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I feel like I've asked a lot of questions, so I'm not going to ask any more questions. But just to say, the books are available for sale at the back. Barbara will be here to sign them. And um, yeah, thank you for coming. And thank you, Barbara, for doing this work. And we hope there shall be many, 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 many more opportunities to talk about this work. Um, I'm not sure if anything, okay, from Exclusive Books. Um, but yeah, thank you. Have a good evening. Please buy the books. 
Um, I see now they've put in Bogoto as well next to the book. So that's the the um, anthology that um, Sister Bando was talking about that Barbara helped us with, and that's the one that Mangobo is in. So you can get a two for one special. Um, <laughs> thank you, everybody, um, and yeah, thank you for for everything. Thank you. Thank you.